So thanks everyone for joining in today. Um, I'm going to, to start my introduction for, for those who have just joined us. We're uh, quite a few participants today, which is exciting. So my name is Alex Horst. I'm a product specialist for 3ds Max. I'm having a 3D Studio DOS background and I grew myself over the years. Um, kind of my, my, my daily bread and butter is 3ds Max. I'm very excited to be here today and talk about the 3ds Max product family and how to use Max and Max Interactive in order to create real-time experiences and virtual reality. So this whole webinar is going to be recorded and put online just this week. By the end of the week, it should be up uh, available online. Just be aware that if you have questions in between, please use the, the, the chat. Uh, you can send the chat to the panelists, which would be me or all attendees as well. Uh, and you know, make yourself familiar and, and nurture for, throughout the, the com community, which is great. So hopefully this works fine for for everyone uh, i do have uh, a lot of videos that i want to show you and we all have this this one hour of time i'll try to finish up early ish in order to allow for more questions in uh, in the end but as i said before if you have questions in between please feel free to ask them. autodesk's virtual reality center of excellence in munich germany is now open let me see if I can crank down the, the, the volume on this video. This is something I really like to show whenever I present and talk about VR, because this, this is from my peers in Munich. If you ever come around uh, southern Germany, give us a call ahead of time, and we can hopefully book you in into this VR center that we have created inside of uh, yeah the, the Munich office. And this is a great experience because it combines all those mixed reality experiences with HTC Vive and, and uh, even AR, um, you know, AR devices, which you can then experience on your own, uh, driven by VRED or uh, Max Interactive, really depending. On what you want to see and we have this green screen and then and mixed reality setup so that's that's really fun to be in and, and just see what's what's possible and you know 3d tracker that that positions or tracks the position of those cameras uh, in order to allow for that set for the setup that you see here so well what else what do you want to what do we want to see today so before I dive in, I want to give a big shout out to my colleague, uh, Jose Elizardo, who has built up the content for today's presentation. He has created the content for Autos University. End of last year, this was presented over in Vegas. So I'm happy to be here in a position today to, yeah, reuse the, the, the content for those who haven't seen it, hopefully and talk about how to get your data, your content from 3ds Max over into Max Interactive, how to then make it look good, you know, make it shine, and how to create interactivities, uh, triggering animations, uh, going through different wall panes and daylight setups, etc. And most importantly, how can we publish that uh, in the very end. The publishing is going to be a very small part of this presentation. It's just a minute, uh, but it shows you um, how, you know, to, to get from scene A to scene B and how to create an exe file or WebGL experience for, uh, for yourself and for your customers. So I'm not sure, and maybe people can type into the chat of um, who has heard about Max Interactive or who has used it. Back in June, basically, we announced that we're bundling what was called the Stingray game engine together with 3ds Max. And out of that is, well, 3ds Max and 3ds Max Interactive. It is important to understand that even though it is integrated into the 3ds Max license, it doesn't automatically install alongside 3ds Max, right? So you would have to go into the Autobus account and download it, uh, and then you can drive it just out of your 3ds Max license or your collection license, if you have an m &E collection or AC collection, right? So, so that's that. So a few people are using it, I can see, that's great. Yeah, so you're using 3ds Max for HEC Wife, Stingray from the very beginning, that's, that's very good. Okay, so we do have a few people who are absolutely familiar with, um, with the engine itself, which is uh, good news. So the whole venture of Autodesk preaching into the virtual reality market, so to speak, reaches back 
very, very long time. Almost 30 years. This picture was taken almost 30 years ago. This is Elva Kring to the left and Chris Ellis were already, you know, getting their hopes up uh, that, that VR or virtual reality and all these devices could eventually be one day something that allows us to, to tell our story and validate different designs. We even created this kind of marketing video right here, which I guess is fun to watch and even, even seeing where the author's logo was once and where it is now. Uh, but you can see, hey, back then, VR was kind of a thing. And it's, it's, it's exciting to see that almost three decades later, um, we are at a state where people can experience it on their own without having to spend millions and millions of, of, of dollars, really. Uh, so obviously, I'm talking about uh, headsets like the Oculus or HTC Vive, which are uh, no enterprise systems, right? Everyone can buy those. Every, every consumer basically has access to these different devices, and we can hook them up to very powerful GPUs and even multi-GPU systems. Uh, even more exciting is that we can run everything on our small phones, right? So kind of a, a low-res or low-quality-ish version of our 3D real-time experience can absolutely be run on, on, our, on our mobile devices. And Max Interactive caters to all those different needs. It even supports uh, the HoloLens and upcoming AR devices. It's, it's absolutely it's, uh, possible to hook up those into uh, Max Interactive. Uh, my colleague, David Menard, who is holding the scripting, Max Interactive scripting class tomorrow, he will have more information on actually how to, how to do that if, you, um, if you're very interested in, in AR. So this is a short video for those who haven't seen Max Interactive, right? So this is just showing how you can access those different templates. As soon as you uh, download and install Max Interactive, you have a number of offline and online templates. Once again, I have to dial down the, the sound slightly. Hopefully that works on your end as well. Uh, this is one of the VR templates that we are shipping with, uh, or basically one of the online templates that you can download and experience, right? And this is just to walk through this kind of machine setup, see how you can interact with the Oculus or the HTC Vive with those different objects, how the sound would be driven alongside the physics system and how you can create special interactions like, yeah, speeding up the video is great, uh, like, like changing the wallpaper, for example. So here we have this color palette, this swatch that you can pick up. And you can define your own custom materials on there. So I'm basically choose one of those, point, at, point and shoot at objects in your scene. And this way, just, experience different setups in terms of material, right? So so this is just a template, right? Before we dive in any further, I just wanted to make you aware of that, right? And we will stake, we'll take a step back and just uh, think about how we create a fully VR experience from step one. And we're going to use content that was happily provided by uh, Alpha Vision, a company that I have to read, provides home builders and real estate developers with basically web consumer engagement and you know, sales technology, including immersive uh, virtual reality. So this is, this is really great. They've provided us with the 3DS Max V-Ray scene, which we'll then take over into Max Interactive. And to give you a better understanding of the scene itself, this is the exterior interior building that we'll be focusing on. Right, so this is a render setup. As I said before, this is a V-Ray scene. And our goal is to take that over into Max Interactive without having to redo uh, everything from the, from the ground up, from, the, from the, the beginning, and basically turn that into a VR experience, if that makes sense, right? So this is where we're headed. This is a, another video that we recorded earlier. This is with the HTC Vive on. It has some icons that we can, you know, hover over and trigger in order to, to, yeah, turn on and off animations like this garage opening and closing. Great. Uh, navigating further, you can see, I mean, all the navigation, all the sound that is being done by the navigation, that is part of the template system. That's nothing you have to worry about. What's, what's kind of added by ourselves is those icons 
and the ability to, for example, change the wall paint and uh, different colors, uh, unicane wallpaper, uh, unicorns. I guess every every scene at one point has to have some some unicorns. So I'm a big fan. Um, you can use the sound system, which we'll actually cover later on. It is the WYS sound system that you're uh, that's driving the sound inside of Max Interactive. You can trigger animations. It's basically the same system as the the garage door or gate opening and closing to sort through different furniture setups. So I'm not sure how many have watched the Netflix Stranger Things series, but uh, I do like it. Great. And yeah, it's, it's absolutely uh, absolutely up to you how far you want to take it in terms of let's go girls in terms of storytelling and how you want to combine that up with you know sound and interact interactions so here we for example can toggle the daylight between day and night yeah and really go through that scene so hopefully showing you how this has been created is going to be helpful and interesting for yeah for most of you. So once again, those are the three pillars that we want to focus on today. Getting the content in, making it look shine, and last but not least, adding those interactions, right? So once again, big shout out to uh, Jose who has created uh, those, those slides, that's, that's really great. So getting your data in is basically straightforward. You start up 3ds Max for the first time and you choose from a template. So one of these templates might fit your, your work style uh, closely. I guess uh, you can start with the HTC Vive or with the Google VR, uh, Samsung Gear VR uh, setup, or you can start with a vehicle setup if you want to drive through a city with your, with your uh, vehicle. That's something that you can do. Uh, but as soon as you've created that template, all you would need to do is create a new level. From there, so this is a plank level that, in the background, is still using this, the logics that are provided within that template. And from there, we can actually, you know, set up our 3ds Max scene and send everything over. And this is how this is done. So here are a few little, I guess, tips and tricks, right, on how to uh, how to set this up. And one thing that's often overseen is the object uh, placement tool. Uh, so this is a little, little icon that is, hopefully I can do this. Yeah, there's my mouse cursor. And that's up, the, up there. And if you do a right click on that icon, it allows you to activate an auto parenting mode, which will take the assets that you're basically placing on top of each other with an auto collision and create it. It's building up a hierarchy, allowing you to, in the end, move that coffee table and all the assets along with it. So that's that's a little tip that we have here. This workflow is inspired and, and basically has been created in, in cooperation with IKEA. So they are using that kind of tool for their scenes. Another little tip here is the uh, how to use the asset library. The 3ds Max asset library, again, is nothing that install, is installed right away, but is available for free in the Exchange Store. So I'm just doing a little bit of advertising for, for these free tools. Mm, this asset library can point to a variety of different network folders or even asset libraries uh, like, like um, uh, online marketplaces. And you can just drag and drop your assets over uh, and replace those and, and go through different iterations of, of furniture, et cetera. So in the end, as soon as you're ready to go and you say, hey, this, this is it, this is what I want to take over into VR. This is where you, create or, or go into the interactive dropdown, which installs alongside with Max Interactive. And this one allows you to send your whole level over into Max Interactive, including, if you wish, if including cameras and lights, uh, all the textures and materials. And basically, if you have Vera, you're in a, in a very good uh, spot because that export or more likely this this import here is converting the vera materials into pbr shaders as good as it as good as it's uh, it's getting it um 
converting those materials so you don't have to redefine any of those textures inside of Mix Interactive, if that makes sense, right? So we've come a long way from, uh, who, who, who said he's using Stingray from the beginning? Christian, right? So Stingray from the beginning, and as you know, it was a pain to get that, those 3D models over into Stingray and Max Interactive later on without that material conversion. And this is now much, much better than it, uh, than it used to be. So um, secondly, what you can do, you can do a live camera tracking or a linking between camera Stingray or camera Max Interactive and 3ds Max. So if you have a two screen setup, you can have Max on one screen, uh, Max Interactive on the second screen, you can go through that setup. And especially when you first import your scene, you want to make sure everything is in place. And if something doesn't you know, uh, just, just, just work out correctly, you're already in place on that specific spot within 3ds Max uh, with that camera link. Another great thing here is that Stingray, uh, Max Interactive, it's the same thing. Uh, Max Interactive Active actually fully supports 3ds Max instances. So if you're taking that chair on that dining table and we're creating instances from that, uh, we can update the scene in Max Interactive with a single click, right? So we're just selecting our chairs, we're sending our selected selection over and without having to wait for an export of FBX data and import of FBX data. Instead, what's happening is it's taking just the transforms, the XYZ for position, rotation, scale, and re-instantiates, if, if that's a word, um, the original chair within Max Interactive. So it's, it's using that one FBX file, and because we've created instances inside of Max, it's, it's yeah, reusing that and just distributes the objects in the scene. Yeah, so, so there's a question by Robin. Any plans to help non-Vera users? Uh, like the direct extractors are hit and miss uh, at best, uh, I agree. So currently, um, I guess Vera materials are your best bet still, um, but we uh, do have abilities to uh, to support other materials, we do have in Max Three uh, is Max Twenty Eighteen. We have this uh, material converter inbuilt. So I guess your best bet right now is convert, for example, um, mint array shaders over into physical materials, which are now fully supported. So this is, yeah, it is physical material. There, there, there's the question right there. Physical material is supported with the latest release of Max Interactive, which was released in December. Uh, and that's version 2.0. So going from mentoring materials, for example, you can automatically convert those into physical materials in Max. And those physical materials are then being converted over into uh, Max Interactive materials, which is fine. Um, so, and there's another question just to confirm through is Max Interactive is only compatible with Max 2018 and later, is that correct? It is. Almost correct, yes. So so I believe the latest engine, like the la latest level syncing is 2018, uh, but it should reach back down to uh, max 2016 uh, because we're always supporting the like, like the last three versions. Um, so, and Sebastian, uh, Sebastian, uh, Sebastian, I'm not sure how to uh, pronounce the name. Uh, I can follow up on that and show you how the mentor or how the physical materials are being created out of mentoring. So absolutely, I can I can do that. I need to follow up on that though. Um, any plans to support i2 softwares like Rayclone and Forcepack? Uh, there's no direct support for those. Uh, so what you would have to do is the same workflow or work around as with Unity. And sorry for being sidetracked here for, for the others, but just thought I would answer some questions. Uh, so when you uh, want to have Forcepack compa make, made compatible to Unity or, or Max Interactive, you would have to uh, bake um, those objects back down to instances, where, which is an option in Forcepack, right? So. Uh, you can you can do that, but there's no direct support. I, I agree that would be great, but there are no plans on that yet. Um, okay, yeah, and mentor ray materials, absolute mentor ray materials should be converted before you send those over into Max Interactive. So you should convert them into physical materials, which is a universal uh, material definition, which is compatible to Corona and V-Ray and mentor ray. And uh, yeah, there it is.
Cool. So I'll, I'll answer some of those questions later on. Let me let just 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 go on for now. So online assets and the scanner tool. This is just still in the rhythm of creating content or uh, basically populating your scene and making the whole thing more believable. What's great is that we are shipping with a bunch of online assets. It's not like an, an open up online asset store as in Unity. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a closed down thing. So Authors is uploading props and materials into that online asset store, which you can then download for free. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that gets you quite far. Uh, instead of having to recreate those basic props for, for real-time interactions, this is something that you can, again, download for free and just reuse. You will see that some of those are pre-animated. For example, all the foliage stuff or the uh, vegetation has vegetation shaders on them, so the leaves would actually wobble in the, in the wind, etc. And none of these materials and none of these objects is kind of a Close down container. So basically, what happens is you're downloading an FBX file, which then makes itself available as 3D data, texture, or material. So, if you, for example, place a car in your scene, uh, you would be able to A, position it. Uh, you can scale it, you can change the material, the color of that car, and you can even send it back into 3ds Max in order to really make it your own by, by, by adding some extra detail to the geometry. So there was a follow-up question on the if the 30s max uh, physical material is converted to PBR and makes interactive, and the answer is yes. That's exactly what happens. Um, and there's another one. Uh, yeah, how does this whole thing compare to Unity and Unreal? I guess I'm answering some of the questions throughout this um, class, and I'm happy to to kind of sum it up in the end. All right. So w one thing that really shines alongside with those uh, props and distributions is the use of the scatter brush that you just saw here. The scatter brush is something that you can set up for whatever prop you want to distribute in your scene. And you can just you know, paint it onto the existing objects and geometries. And it will allow you to fade, fade away over distance, for example, for performance reasons, right? So you could say everything that's 200 meters out, uh, all those crass uh, objects would actually scale down. And here we're using a global wind shader, which is an, a helper object that drives or helps you drive and control the wind amount and, 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 and turbulence, turbulence of all the vegetation shaders in your scene. So this is very easy to control and you could even animate that. So, so if you wanted to have different weather effects and make it very stormy, you could just control and animate those amounts there here. It's a slightly sped up video, that's why it's wobbling very, very, very fast, but you get the idea of where it's getting you and how easy it is to you know, scatter that stuff in your uh, scene. So there's another question. Can a full Stingray scene be sent back to 3ds Max? Actually, you can uh, select your whole level and you can create an FBX file out of that. You're losing, however, however, the material definitions on those objects. So it's not super easy to get back. We're working, though, and this is something I'm showing on the next video, on a live connection between Stingray or Max Interactive, excuse me, uh, Max Interactive and Max. Uh, bi-directional. So changes that you make in your scene in Max Interactive will be converted back live into your Max scene and vice versa. This is great for everyone who wants to use VR as a setup tool and still wants to go back into Max to use uh, Corona or V-Ray or some, some Arnold uh, engine to, to render out their high definition, uh, you know, print renders or create a VR pre-rendered panorama. Mm. So I need to follow up one more question. Is 3ds Max Interactive mandatory to be able to display direct X materials in the viewport in Max? So I'm working in Max 2017, he says, and try different builds in uh, built-in renderer and was unable to install Max Interactive so far. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, no, for first of all, you don't have to use the DirectX or Stingray material, uh, which is a DirectX shader inside of Max in order to make those materials auto-convert in uh, in Max Interactive, you just have to make sure that you're you're using either a Vera material, a standard material, or a physical materials. Those are the three that are automatically converted 
when you're exporting from Max into Max Interactive. For the Max viewport, uh, you can continue using your random materials, right? Um, and the and I agree because that's something we have mentioned earlier. The Stingray shader inside of Max, because we have a direct Stingray shader in, in, in Max, this needs to get some love in order to you know be more photorealistic in the viewport. Um, for now, I would recommend just staying maintaining your render materials inside of Max and let Stingray Max Interactive handle the auto conversion into PBR. Okay, and I will have to look as I have to follow up on why you do you weren't able to install uh, Max Interactive. So this is another online asset. Uh, you can download materials. Um, whilst some of the materials, or as as we mentioned or said earlier, those sphere materials, for example, are automatically getting converted. Doing animated materials is something that you can do on your own, or you can get a starting point like this water shader uh, that ha would that has an animated displacement. Uh, shader and just throw it onto your, your water planes. And this is a rubber duck which actually has been pre animated in Max. Uh, but what's really nice is even though it's already in Max Interactive, you can with a single click send it back into Max. You can make some changes to the model like that, whatever you want to do. And because you send it from Max Interactive into Max, you just need to hit the update button and it knows which FBX file it would need to override or update in order to make to populate those changes into your scene. Cool. So this is, I, I mean, personally, this is great if you really want to include some of the changes um, that are discussed with your customer and you want to, you have to tweak some of the models. So, um, I guess, Mike, this is back to your question. You know, how do I get my stuff from Max Interactive back into Max? Uh, this is the lifelink that I've been talking about. So this is something we're still working on. Uh, this is using an IKEA uh, shelf, as you can see here, the Calyx uh, shelf. And I'm using the Max Creation Graph, which is a procedural framework within Max. And in that case, it's been used to procedurally distribute different sets of objects in that shelf. So. Remember the, the dining table and the chairs that I distributed and I talked about how instances are fully supported by Max Interactive. Uh, we are doing the same thing here. So I've already, there we go. I've already exported all those little objects back here. So all these little objects, they are already inside of Max Interactive. And now what the MCG allows me to do is I'm going to pull the original objects and basically create instances on the position uh, that the MCG has calculated. So, and I'm, I'm already in a live transform mode, which is under development right now. So I hit bake, everything gets updated live in Max, into Max Interactive. So I'm just using MCG kind of as, the, as a distribution stamp or a stencil in my scene, go through different seats of, you know, creating my stuff, hit bake and it's, appears like that inside of Max Interactive. Now here's where the magic happens. As soon as you're kind of good to go and this looks okay, uh, you might experience something that's not fully relevant in VR. So you could go into Max Interactive on the left-hand side and you make changes to these objects. And as you can see on the right-hand side, even duplicating objects is being brought back into Max life without having to press the update button. Absolutely, yes. So this is, uh, but this is optional, right? So you, uh, you turn this option on and off. Uh, it's basically like the live camera track, right? It's, a, it's another option to link the transforms live. So if you do rotations, movement, scaling, or uh, duplicating objects, all that will automatically be trans uh, distributed over into Max and also back into Max Interactive. So if you prefer to make your changes inside of Max, rather than do it in a Max Interactive, this will automatically get, uh, get updated. Yeah, I like it, it's good. They are instances, they are not duplicates. Yeah, I'm just saying duplicates as, as in the, the, the sense of ob objects, but they are instances, they are instances. 
Cool. All right. So finally, uh, this is a little tool, as we all know, uh, that I'm going to use to show that character animation is fully supported wherever you want to, to take your characters from, really. Uh, but this is the Populate tool. For those who haven't used that for real-time stuff, there's this little icon here, which is called Bake Selected. And it basically takes the vertex animation of the Populate characters and bakes it down to a bone system, which is then fully compatible to Unreal, to Unity, to Max Interactive, right? And we send that over as an FBX file and including the animation. And as soon as that's there, we can actually position our objects in the scene. We can preview the animation, we can position that right there. Beautiful. <laughs> and, um, and of course, you can customize the, the texture of the skin that has been created by, by Populate as well. What's, what's nice is that it allows you every animation that is imported into Max Interactive, it allows you to be controlled in different ways. And this is a way which is called the animation controller that besides other more powerful stuff allows you to loop animations. So here we are just creating that looping state. And the looping state allows you also to create blended animations. So if you have 1,000 frames of populate animation and one, and this should be looped, uh, there might be a difference between frame 1,000 and frame zero, and you can kind of cross blend between those frames with whatever 50 frames or so, and, and make that blend together without having to worry too much and fiddle around too much with the keyframes inside of uh, Max itself. So the next step is making it shine, making it look beautiful. You now have all your content in the scene, but it still might not look right. It might not look uh, as good as it could, right? So I guess, first of all, uh, before we focus on that, in order to do, for example, light making, you would need lights. And on purpose, we didn't distribute or, or export the lights in, uh, from 3ds Max yet. So with the release of Max Interactive 2.0 in December, last December, uh, we are now also supporting photometric lights with, I, um, with IES light profiles. So you can assign IES light profiles inside of Max Interactive. Uh, but first and foremost, you can actually export your lights from Max and you know, bring them over into, into Max Interactive. We're still working on getting all of the settings right, especially if you're working with uh, those uh, so-called photometric lights in Max. Uh, but you have access to all these parameters and there are, you know, group edits, which allow you to select multiple lights and just re reassign some of those um, settings. So here's a little thing that people stumble upon a little bit uh, when working with lights inside of Stingray. By default, every object is casting an object is casting a shadow no matter which material is, is assigned to it, right? So for example, these glass panels in the windows, they are casting shadows right now. And uh, luckily you can open that up and you can disable that checkbox that says cast shadows and you save that back down. And then you have the daylight system, which is bringing you know light from the outside you have that casting light into you into your scene so i'm not sure if i understand correctly sebastian can we change this original setting i'm not not, not sure so not sure here's another thing changing the background right Right, so this is so crucial in order to make your scene more believable. Uh, and there's a, its own, Singer has its own help article on how to basically create a, a 3D panorama or how to convert the HDR image into a DDS file format, which is then supported by, um, by Max Interactive. And uh, this is this is crucial because as soon as uh, you are working with an HDR panorama, you can use it in the light baking as an image-based lighting uh, source, right? So you can uh, distribute light in the scene based on that HDR panorama. So now I understand uh, the question was, can we change that original shadow cast object uh, that every, every object is casting uh, shadows by default? Well, no, you cannot. But luckily, all these objects are basically, all the, the properties of these objects are stored in 
text files. So these, this is a JSON definition. Uh, everything is data driven inside of Max Interactive, and you can do a mass edit with the Notepad++ Notepad++ and just search through for that setting. And with a single click, so I have different presets for Notepad++ myself, with a single click, I can uh, make all of those uh, shadows disappear, you know, just, just like that. <clears throat> Very good. Cool. So here, when we talk about light baking, and this was kind of my segue of going from image-based lighting into light baking, uh, you have to decide which objects or which lights you want to bake down. So for example, for the artificial lights, we can choose that it should bake down direct and indirect lights. But maybe we want to animate the sunlight later on. And this would allow us to, for example, for the sun, only bake down the indirect light, which distributes, you know, creates a nice global illumination. Uh, but it still allows us to drive the real-time shadows in, in a real time and interact with those. So as soon as we have you know, dug through the light baking process, we can hit bake. This is a GPU-based light bake. So the more powerful your GPU, the faster it will actually go through that light pass. But what's most beautiful about that whole process is that Max Interactive allows it to automatically generate the second set of UVs, which is a, a unique set of mapping coordinates, which will be used to store your shadow and uh, light distribution data, right? And this is usually something that's painful to do on your own without any plugins manually inside of 3ds Max, which is something that you would have to do for other game engines, right? So Max Interactive does that for you, which is nice. And it also allows you to go through different analytical views. For example, you can display the light map taxel distribution in your scene, which shows you, you know, kind of the resolution of that, of that light map on those different objects, which is nice because sometimes you might have a product that you want to um, really focus the most quality on, if that makes sense. So this would allow you to, to take that coffee machine and uh, create a denser light map taxel resolution or distribution on that specific object or your, your car or whatever product you really want to emphasize. All right. And this is showing the diffuse light map. This is just the bake that we see here. And the beauty is that we are still kind of interactive in terms of that we didn't bake down the direct illumination of the sun. So we can still animate the sun, which I'm going to show you later. Uh, this is a little trick here. Uh, we can actually support LODs or level of detail versions. There's no dy dynamic LOD system inside of Max Interactive, but if you're using tools like the Pro Optimizer inside of Max, you can create different versions uh, in terms of um, polygon resolutions of your object. So you have two different versions of that sofa, one high res, one low res. And in that case, instead of switching between those LODs, uh, depending on the, uh, on, the, on the screen space consumption, I'm now using the low res sofa in order to cast shadow, but make it invisible in the viewport and have the high res sofa appear in the viewport, but it doesn't have to calculate the shadows for the high res object. I guess that's complicated to understand. I'm just trying to say that uh, you can tweak a whole lot of things inside of Mix Interactive in order to gain the best performance out of it, right? You can ha also have classic uh, LODs, which would switch between high res sofa and low res sofa, depending on how far you are away. Another quick and easy trick to brighten up your scene and make it more believable is to position reflection probes throughout your scene. Those reflection probes are going to store kind of a pre-baked environment. So it's, it's, it's going to render your scene and reuse the, the panorama or the cube map that's created on those reflection maps in order to drive the reflection in your, in your scene in kind of kind of in real time but uh, you know you you won't be able to animate much with the reflection probes but you can combine those re with actual real time reflections here's another nice setting you can tweak auto exposures so depending on where you are and if you go in a very dark corner you could have auto in an auto exposure level um, kicking in you can have screen space ambient occlusion dial dialing in 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 real time as 
just like that, just to boost the, the kind of quality that you get out of the light bake. And there are other stuff uh, like, like a depth of field, a bloom effect, a vignetting, color grading. All of this is defined in the default shading environment, which is part of the, the Max Interactive experience. Ooh, okay, so, so that's kind of the thing about getting stuff done in terms of um, uh, support, etc. So in, ter in terms of, of uh, viewport quality. So if there's another question, when will video files be supported? So um, I haven't checked. I have, to, I have to check because there, there was the plan to support that with the 2.0 version of Max Interactive, which we already released. It could be that this was pushed out to the next point release of Max Interactive. Yeah, and this is important because video files, the, the whole effort of supporting video files also um, has more stuff behind it. So basically placing videos as textures, but also being able to render uh, environments as textures onto onto geometries, like creating a mirror in a bathroom that actually displays or ray traces the player, right? Instead of just being a vampire and not visible in that mirror. Uh, that, that kind of stuff, that's something that we will support uh, based on that um, effort. All right, physics. So this is the whole branch of creating interactions inside of Max Interactive. So in order to be able to interact with stuff in your scene, you have to create colliders. And there are different ways of doing it. So the classic way is to select an object like this floor, open it, opening it up in the unit editor and create a physics actor and done. A newer way is, which has just been, you know, I believe shipped in, Max Interactive 2.0 is you can select multiple objects at once in the asset browser down here and do a right click and just say, hey, make those, turn this, those into a static collision object. So it's easy as, as that. And this is important because without that collision object, even with a VR template, you wouldn't be able to teleport onto these objects because there's just no collision. So now just with the, with the collision on the floor, we are able to move around in the scene, teleport upon that floor and be good to go. But this is all static physics objects, right? So you can do another one, which would be dynamic physics objects. So uh, we've, we've uh, defined the, the kitchen area as being collision objects and the, the cooking pot to be dynamic, a dynamic object. This is great because you can, you know, you can even bundle up WY's audio uh, with that pot and you can, obviously throw it around and yeah, interact with things in your scene by defining which objects should be dynamic, which objects should be static and which objects shouldn't have physics at all, right? So there, there might be something like little details that you just don't need physics uh, calculation upon. All right, so next step is animation. This is a very rough, uh, like a brief video on how to export navigations and how to trigger and toggle those within Max Interactive. Uh, so for example, here we have this garage door. And I mean, this is just with a path constraint right now. Um, personally, I would probably would do this with a, with a spline IK system, but you get the idea of, you know, how that, how we are creating that animation right there. This is where we want to start from. So, with those objects selected with a, with a keyframed animation, we can now export that. And there are two ways of exporting animations. One is just export your selection as an FBX file. And the second one is displayed down here, but we are not going to use it in the video. Uh, the second one is to use the game exporter, which is very, very comfortable because it supports um, templates and it supports to put down multiple animations into one FBX file. So if you have a door that's opening and closing, that are that's two different animation clips, right? And you can place that in one FBX file with the game exporter. So within Max Interactive, you're just importing the FBX file, no matter where it comes from. Make sure that you hit the animation checkbox because without that, it will not read the animation out of that FBX file. Uh, we're doing this twice because we have imported, kind of uh, ex exported traditionally two FBX files without the game exporter. But here are the animation clips. 
once again, the same way as the, with the populate character, you can pre preview that in your scene. And uh, now here's how you trigger it. So we do have a level flow system, which is, I guess, it's, it's a schematic system on uh, that is being used to define player interactions or scene interactions and, and logics in your in your scene in your Max Interactive scene. Uh, all these flow nodes that you see here, they are in the back. They are basically fired or driven by Lua script files, so you can even open up those and create your own um, custom flow notes, which again is going to be uh, shown to you tomorrow in another scripting class. Um, so there's a question, or maybe do some helpers and Max for creating triggers, collisions, motion paths, etc. Yes, absolutely. So, and that's a very good point, right? So if you, if you want to have collisions, you can do yeah, absolutely. You can like it like in Vermal. Uh, you can do low res objects, basically create colliders inside of Max uh, that are being used to navigate around in your scene without having to calculate the high res geometry, that, that kind of stuff. So that's that's uh, very practical. So what we've done here now, I have to, to pull back a little bit, is we've, we've created a play animation flow note for both animations, opening and closing, and we're using keyboard toggle uh, in order to drive that animation. So uh, this is a flow subroutine, but this could be just a keyboard toggle that toggles between one and zero, uh, all the way, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And so if I hit the one key on my keyboard, there you go, you have the animation being um, you know, toggled and the, the gate is opening or closing. Mm. Right. Mm, so there are more questions coming in. Uh, let me pull through the last two videos so we are, we we can sum this up, and and, and I'm going to to answer some of the the other questions. All right. Yeah. Assembly animations. Oh, absolutely. You can export very complex animations uh, from 3ds Max and just trigger those inside of Stingray. So here's another one. We are using the same flow subroutine to basically, it's, it's like, a, like a state machine, uh, which allows us to toggle through one, two, three, four. Each time we hit a button, it will send a different energy impulse and you know, if you, if you will, and there we go, and set a different mesh slot material. So we have four different materials down here, and I want to change or toggle through those different materials. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a never a good question here. So I'm prototyping with the keyboard shortcut here, and Malte is asking, uh, if it isn't possible to just trigger the animation with the wife remote, and absolutely is, it is, right? Instead of using the keyboard input, you would have your, your wife remote uh, triggering that, defining whichever keyboard or, or uh, wife button you want to want to toggle. This is just for prototyping purposes, like checking if the flow uh, logic works. Um, this is very, very straightforward to actually just you know, do a mouse control or a keyboard control. But uh, obviously, I'm going to show you how to do that with a wife in two, three minutes. So just to conclude uh, the animation topic, uh, there is a nav navigation framework within Max Interactive, which is called the Story Tool. And the Story Editor, it has its own timeline it's not as comfortable as animating in Maya or 3ds Max, but it allows you to animate even in-game or in-engine parameters like the environment shader, shader, right? So, so having the auto exposure being animated, that that kind of stuff. That those are parameters that are uh, by nature not available to you inside of Max. So this is why you would have to use this, the story tool in order to do that. And what we are doing here is we are creating a story setup, which then we can toggle. Like a like an animation clip, in order to drive the daylight system, and we are uh, doing multiple things here. We are driving the rotation, then we are dimming down the light intensity. But because we have an auto exposure, we also would need to to kind of adjust the the overall exposure of our level, bring that down. Uh, then you see that the background is still very bright, and this is just because it's using that HDR background. So we'd have to to um, 
kind of dim down the sky intensity for the background. That's all the stuff that's available to you in the story tool. Think about creating cinematics with Max Interactive. This is the, the place where you could actually also animate the, the depth of field, like um, the focus point of your the focal point. That's correct uh, of your of your camera. This is this is where you could animate all of that. Simple animations like uh, moving a chair or a door. I personally would prefer to do that inside of Max Interactive uh, because it's a little bit more straightforward to, to animate it right there. But once again, uh, as soon as you have created your story, you pick it up in the flow editor, right? And we have two stories, one for night, one for day. And we just hook that up to our prototyping keyboard shortcut. In the long run, this is going to be an icon in our scene, which we can approach with our HTC Vive and, and hit in order to you know, toggle through day and night setting. But you see here, it's working beautifully. Uh, it's changing the daylight intensity. It's also cranking up the emiss emissive values of the material of the of the chandelier of the uh, lamps so that's that cool so we're almost good to go i'm trying to be time aware here for those who have to carry on so uh, one yeah two i believe two more videos right here and this is uh talking about the audio wise audio engine which I guess it's important to understand that this is shipping for free inside of Max Interactive. It is a full-blown, fully licensed audio engine developed by Audio Connect, um, being used in a whole bunch of different uh, AAA game titles. And all you will need to do is you import your audio file, and WYS is, 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 is authoring it in terms of where it should be positioned, how it should behave in 3D space. It's also automatically converting it to all those different platforms. So iOS devices, Android devices, all of those need different sound uh, uh, file format standards, right? So that was just a little error because we've deleted in the process of this demo, we deleted two sound files, but it's here you see it's creating a sound bank with those triggers in order to play the sound file. And as long as it's a 3D sound file, we can drag and drop that into Max Interactive in our scene. Uh, we have the attenuation, the volume attenuation, like the distance controlling the volume of our scene. So as soon as I, I generate that, it's actually, active, it's actually um, changing the default value for our volume for, for this 3D sound. If we listen closely... New music. Right? So here's a question. Is it possible to connect your HTC Vive into Max Interactive? That's exactly what we do here. So we are prototyping with the HTC Vive right now. And even more important, uh, whilst we are in the HEC Vive, um, we are hooking up the WY sound system into that player playing environment. And now we can prototype and fiddle around with the sounds as we are experiencing uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the level in the HEC Vive. So for example, I want to make the sound appear a little bit more muffled. Uh, when we're that far away and behind that wall. So I can add a low pass filter that is driven by distance. Hopefully you can hear that. Very dimmed down right now. As I move down here, it's back to full volume. So you can do so much with WYS, which is uh, practically super powerful in order to, to drive your storytelling, giving audio cues, uh, adding narration to your scenes, etc. Uh, last but not least, user interface. I mean, the whole user interface idea, uh, U UI in, in VR, that's still something that's kind of under development for, for everyone. There are no real standards, I guess. 
And um, this is something that we've, we've uh, created here. This is just a 3D icon that has been extruded or could be extruded from a kind of an illustrator path. And we are uh, adding a few triggers here. So for example, we want to drive the scale of that icon based on that yellow trigger volume. So as soon as we're in that trigger volume, the icon will appear, making the user, the viewer, aware of, hey, there's something I can interact with. Mm. Okay, there are more and more questions. Uh, so our, there's a spline object inside of Max Interactive. Can we use that for something? Uh, it's, it's not really as powerful as a Max uh, spline object. We can like not currently not extrude objects alongside uh, those, those uh, splines. So I guess we can use it for motion paths or driving particle systems along those splines. It's, it's a little bit premature, that system, because it hasn't been touched for a while, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, back to this icon, uh, what we have done here, we've linked up the head mount display rotation to that icon. So no matter where, from where we look at it, we'll always face, like a billboard, uh, face the viewer. There we go, right? So I'm not sure, Mike, about how to use it as a motion path. I would have to 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 look and dive dig into that. Very good. Cool. Lastly, and I have to read up on some other questions. Uh, we are adding a click event on that icon, and as soon as we click, we want to make that click event available inside our uh, inside our of our level. We are also highlighting the the, the icon as we hover over it. Right. This is in some. This is kind of built in. This this highlighting effect. But here's how you would do that on your own. There's a hover event. So since we hover over it with the laser or with the HTC Vive or Oculus controller, it would uh, give kind of an outline material that shows us, hey, we have we, we have a hit basically, right? And then finally, we go back into our level flow, and this is back to, hey, why didn't we hook up our uh, controller to that whole flow subroutine. This is what we do here. We're using the click output of that icon in order to trigger that animation instead of hitting the one key on our keyboard. So I'm hitting it with our laser, or I can basically hit it, also hit it with our controller by our, ourselves and use that as an event. Very good. Okay, so this is a 30 second video and then we I will focus on the on the Q&A, release and deploy. And because this is something people will stumble upon, uh, releasing or deploying is relatively simple, but making Max Interactive really playing out the level that you would like it to play out is a little bit hidden. So what you would need to do is you go and search for a project.lua file, open that up, and here's the default level that it will always take and play out by default, basically, right? And, and this, is, this is a template thing. So this was named as after, after the template. So you would just rename that to the level that you want to play out. And then you go into your deployer, which allows you again to go into WebGL, into iOS, into Android, or just use um, a package project for Windows which would generate an exe file alongside with the with a full structure of all your textures and materials, etc. Right. So uh, that authoring is done in Max Interactive, and it will automatically be, you know, publishable to all these different platforms. Very good. And this is just a screenshot of uh, my Autodesk account, or I believe it's mine. Yeah, it's mine. Uh, <laughs> on how to and where to find how to download Max Interactive. Basically, go to your Max product, wherever that is in your collection or standalone product, and there's another download method, which is, or another download article, which is Max Interactive, right? So that's as easy as it gets. And it's, well, it will automatically take the Max uh, license or collection license, right? So this is kind of what we've talked about. Mm. Showing how to get content in, how to make it look beautiful, uh, talking about the shading environment, the reflection probes, the light baking, how to add interactivity into your scene, including uh, triggering animations, including sound, and well, publishing and where to download Max Interactive.
cool. So um, let me answer some of the questions. Let me, let me scroll back a little bit. So Tobias had to go, thank you. Um, so I'm going to follow up on the splines and motion path questions from uh, uh, Nico and Mike, which is great. Um, how to reduce G-buffer if some items are in another room that VR, uh, the VR user is not? So that's a very good question. So, so basically what you would need to do is you would work with so-called occluders. Uh, so there, there's an occlusion helper object, which, you, which is just uh, like, a, like a trigger box. You can draw that up as kind of a occlusion occluder object. So everything that's between the viewer and that occluder, no, between the viewer that's behind the, the, the occlusion object will not be rendered. Or you could generally go into your, select your ceilings, your floors and your walls go into the unit editor and turn those into occluders without having to re regenerate those helping op helper objects. So this generally solves a lot of, uh, you know, performance issues. Is there a place where I can download that kind of icon and content? Um, we don't have the, the icon online, I'm afraid, uh, but think of getting uh, vector graphics for those icons, uh, which I guess you would, just Google for. As soon as you have vector graphics, you can down, uh, import that into 3ds Max and give it a little bit of extrusion. You can animate that and just export it into Max Interactive. Uh, how to change level without plaque latency in, um, in Interactive? Mm, I would have to see if there's a kind of, kind of a pre-buffering if you want to load in and out. Uh, what we have created in one of the templates is a loading screen, so it would fade over into the loading screen and you know fade, fade off as soon as the other level is loaded. So I will have to, to see where we can get that. And basically what I want to show you is also my email address. So you, uh, please get in touch with me so I can follow up on some of these questions. I will save down the chat file and usually I should be able to look up the email address that you use to register with. So here's another question by Malta. What about just getting close and getting it to open without any buttons? Absolutely, you can do that. Uh, so forget about the icons. Just think about that uh, yellow trigger box that we have created. You would use that trigger box in order to drive the animation or drive whatever you want to drive, right? Because that's a trigger on its own. You just get into that uh, trigger volume and it will open and close. There's another thing that you could do by ray tracing uh, or, or by calculating the, the vector length um, between the viewer and an object. And as soon as it's you know, down to three meters, you would trigger something like that, right? But the trigger volume, generally speaking, is a very easy thing to do, um, I guess. Um, in my account, there's only 1.8 listed. So I believe it could be that Max Interactive 2.0 is now called Max Interactive 2018 or something, yes? Uh, is augmented reality supported? It is. So there is a class. Um, so, so we do have HoloLens support, so to speak, right? And there's a class by David Menard, uh, which has been recorded from Autism University. I have to look it up uh, on how he's explaining what add-ons to download in order to fully support the HoloLens. But he will be available in tomorrow's class on scripting inside of Max Interactive as well. Um, Okay, and then another one to be installed in order to use the old Singray to be available in 2.0 and 1.8. So I'm not sure if that's a question. In general, Stingray and Max Interactive, each of the versions are living in different folders. So you can have multiple of these uh, installed side by side, which is a very good thing because some of the projects you won't, don't want to update to a newer version because of the potential that you could break things, right? So uh, there's always the option to have the old versions of Max Interactive still living on your system without you know, causing any trouble. Mm, can you preview 3DSi Live into the Samsung Gear VR? I haven't tried. You should be able to do that, yes. Um, so here's another one by Robin. Uh, workflow at present. Revit to life with a sidestep. No, 
with a sidestep to Max Interactive for some better animations, etc. Materials, always the problem. Any suggestions? So, um, for those of you who don't know, there's this the option to use um, what we call uh, the Revit to Live workflow, which is basically using a cloud processing to uh, convert a Revit scene into a Stingray engine or, or web player. Uh, and he, in those projects, they are fully compatible now since the release of Max um, Interactive 2.0 and Live 2.0. They are fully compatible to each other. That should solve some of those material problems as well, uh, because up until now, they have been kind of branching away from each other, and they brought that back into the same kind of Stingray, underlying Stingray engine version. Uh, so now you can natively open up those uh, live files and uh, save those back, and, and should be able to go to 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 play those in the in the live editor. So Robin, you should give that a try with the 2.0 version. I'm not like super sure, uh, but I can follow up. Um, will Windows Mixed Reality hardware be supported in the future? I um, I'm, don't have the answer to that. I will have to ask the product owners, Brian. So I'm not sure. Um, Max Interactive itself is a very open system, so which ships with an SDK, so you can always hook up your own uh, hardware and kind of use Lua as an interface between uh, C++ libraries or C++ um, plugins. So you could do it on your own, which I don't want you to, to, to go through that painful work. So I'll have to find out where our plans are. Uh, so your build, Sebastian, uh, you, yes, your building would turn into an includer, but you would have to define which walls should, should add, um, should be used as an occluder because otherwise it will all be flickery and flimsy. Uh, you would have to define that ceiling and that wall, everything that's behind that ceiling and behind that wall should be occluded. So I turned those objects, those pillars or those walls into an occluder. Um, Please answer. Using this as an offline renderer question, such as rendering out an image uh, sequence. Yes, uh, absolutely. You can do that. Um, there is the option to just yeah render out a pre-animated image sequence as an open EXR file. I believe we are still working on adding support for render elements so that you have the depth path, depth of field path, and um, the ambient occlusion path, all of that available for later use in, in Uke or After Effects or wherever you want to uh, do your, your posts on your comp in. Can I share the loading screen, uh, Sebastian? I have to follow up on that. I, I'm, I can share it, absolutely. That's a template thing. I have it uploaded somewhere. Uh, let, me, let me find it, let me share it. Uh, at the start of the webinar, you mentioned a scripting class. Where do you find this and how to attend? Very good question. And I hope you're still here because I'm going to provide you with the registration link to that. The scripting class is taking place tomorrow at the very same time as today's, which is uh, 3 p.m. Center European time. And uh, I'm going to fire up the registration link into the chat. So this is Meet the Experts, an introduction to scripting and Max Interactive. Uh, oh my God, and there's so much more. Link for the script, oh, Michael, uh, I'm way behind. You already linked it up, sorry, thank you. Uh, Okay, okay, and Bruno answered some questions. That, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for helping out on that. That's very good. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was like up here and the chat was down there. So there we go. So this is all for it for today. Sorry for overrunning. Um, I hope the essence of the, the webinar was within the hour and we just did overrun with the questions really. I want to thank you very much for attending. If you have any questions, feel free to follow up with um, via email or even social media. If you can me, you know, find me up on Facebook. Um, and we'll try to get the recording up on YouTube by the end of the week, right? And we'll link it up to the Meet the Experts. I believe everyone's getting a kind of a thank you email with a link to the recording as well. So once again,
thank you very much. Thanks to Bruno and uh, Jose for, for providing the content for, for the class. That, that was amazing. Yeah, and if you have feedback questions that come to mind a few days and you know from now, just again, feel free to reach out. And I'll save down the, the chat and I'll try to follow up with Sebastian and Mike. And there were some others, some other open questions. Uh, Brian, right? I'll reach out to you guys, get you some answers. I wish everyone a good week, a good day, and thanks for dropping by. All right, talk to you soon.